And I like to cut to the chase, so if you only remember two things from my presentation, these are them. So the first thing I want you to remember is that Alberta Agriculture and Forestry has developed an online cutworm reporting tool. It went live in 2015. They're asking producers to provide information on cutworm outbreaks that they have encountered on their land with some additional information. So the type of information they're asking producers to submit would include the rough land location, the number of acres affected, whether or not the producer opted to spray, the cutworm species, the crop being damaged, and the crop in the field in the previous year. So I'll come back to the cutworm map tool in just a few slides. And the second thing I just want you to remember is that most of my presentation is coming out of this book. You all should have a copy of it. If not, there's more copies available at the registration desk. If you're not able to get a hard copy, it's freely available online through Agriculture Canada. So just Google search Cutworm Guide Agriculture Canada and you'll find it. You can download it as a PDF in either English or French. I like talking about bugs, I really do. I feel fortunate to have the job that I do. But I'll try and just talk about uh, cutworms and Lepidoptera, which include the butterflies and moths. Just to give you an idea of the diversity of the butterflies and moths in Alberta, we have about uh, 2,400 species of those two groups combined. And then if we focus just on the moths, we have about uh, 2,200 species. And then within the group of moths, there's another group called noctuid moths, which we have about 770 species. And then within the noctuids, we finally work our way down to the cutworms, which is the subject of today's presentation. And there's many different types of cutworms, but we're really focused on just about 15 or 20 species that form a pest complex that affect agricultural crops in the prairies. And even to me, I've studied these darn things for a few years, a lot of cutworms look the same, a lot of the moths look the same. So you can see a picture of an adult moth here. They generally are patterned in various shades of brown and gray, nothing jumps out. Same with the caterpillars. The caterpillars tend to be dull colored, gray, brown. A lot of the different species look the same. So this is just to give you a side-by-side -side comparison of some of the more common pest species. And when you have them side by side, it's much more easy to see the differences between some of the species. Yellow-headed cutworm, for example, jumps out, sort of a, a dull brownish yellowy color with a darker colored head capsule. But if I look at things like the redback cutworm, the dingy cutworm, and the dark-sided cutworm, if I didn't have those side by side, they all look the same to me. So all I can tell you is that it's a very complex pest complex, and I'll come back to that theme time and time again. Details on the individual species, again, it's all in this book. I don't have to read it to you, you can read that yourself. But just be aware that there's a complex of about 15 species that we're talking about. Now the reason we're interested in cutworms is because of the economic impact. When I prepared the book, I went back as far as I could into the uh, published papers about 100 years back. They were the first reports of cutworm damage in Alberta. And all of the pest species of cutworms are native to Canada. They're not introduced. And what has changed is the landscape. So originally before European settlement, we had native species feeding on native grasses, native broadleaf species. We got rid of all that plant diversity and we replaced it with just a few major crop species. And certain cutworm species have identified those crops as their preferred food and their populations can do very well from time to time, causing these outbreaks. So pale western cutworm was the first cutworm reported to be causing damage in Alberta. It was a three-year cutworm outbreak cycle in Montana where losses were estimated at 54 million. And all the dollar values on this slide are converted to their equivalent in 2015 dollars. There was a six-year cycle across southern Alberta and southern Saskatchewan where losses were estimated at about uh, 340 million. And then more recently we had an outbreak affecting a quarter of a million acres in southern Alberta with estimated losses of about 16 million. So that's just one species in the pus complex causing that damage. Army cutworm, in 1990 there was an outbreak affecting 25,000 acres in southern Alberta. About 15,000 acres were sprayed and the, the others were reseeded without spraying. And then glassy cutworm in 2000 we had another outbreak causing about $7 million in damage. So these are just the hard numbers I was able to find in published papers. 
but every year we have cutworm outbreaks caused by different species. It's very hard to predict when those outbreaks are going to occur, which crops are going to be affected, but they occur year after year. So in recent years, if you look at the provincial entomology reports, you'll see mention of outbreaks of redback cutworm, pale western cutworm, dingy cutworm, bursley cutworm, variegated cutworm, army worm, and black army cutworms. And the species that are of primary concern in Alberta are somewhat different than the ones affecting crops in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. So it varies with the region of the prairies. So this brings us back to this online uh, reporting tool. If you get onto the website, you'll see a map like this. And I have uh, been given the data that went into that map to generate some slides to make a couple of specific points. So as I said before, the map went live in 2015. It relies on people such as yourself and me, uh, crop scouts, to send in information to the people that maintain this website. And as they get information of cutworm outbreaks, they update the map in almost real time. So if there's an outbreak reported yesterday in your area, you can check this map, find out what's going on on your neighbor's land, get out in your field, start scouting and identifying potential cutworm problems. So for the purposes of this presentation, there were 124 reported outbreaks over the uh, three years based on information provided to the tool. I've color coded each year with a different color. So yellow is 2015, white is 2016, red is 2017. Breaking down those 124 reports, the average person reported outbreaks affecting 167 acres, but it ranged from one acre of land being affected to 640 acres of land being affected. And in about 60% of the cases, the farmers opted to spray. Again, these numbers grossly underestimate the extent of the problem. This is just information provided to the tool, and you can be damn sure there's more than 23 cutworm outbreaks in Alberta in 2015. Now, the message you can take away from this is that these outbreaks affect all agricultural areas of the province. That's the main message. So now we're looking at the species associated with these outbreaks, again, based on the 124 reports provided to the online tool. I've tried to color code it as best I can. So the most common species reported with outbreaks is redback cutworm, shown in red. And then we have pale western cutworm, shown in white, and gingy cutworm, shown in green. Now really, the only take home message here is that redback cutworm can affect acres anywhere in the agricultural area of the province. Similarly, for dingy cutworm in green, we have fewer reports, but they also span the extent of the agricultural area in the province. And possibly significant, we have pale western cutworm, which so far apparently has not been reported to cause outbreaks in the Peace River region, but anywhere south of Edmonton to the border, it's a problem. So as we get more people putting more information into this tool, in 2018, 2019, we can better develop these patterns and advise people on what actions to take to minimize cutworm damage. There's one spot of uh, five black points shown on this map, and you have to consider the quality of the data. As I said before, these cutworms are difficult to identify. So these five outbreaks were all associated with uh, dark-sided cutworm, probably by the same person in one year in a local area. That may be a misidentification, I don't know, but as we get more reports, and as other people report dark-sided cutworm in the province, then maybe that's a new species we have to pay more attention to. Now let's just focus on the three most common cutworm species causing damage. So they were reported associated with 111 of the 124 reports that we have data for. And just to summarize the column on the uh, far right, so most of the damage or outbreaks in 64% of the cases were associated with outbreaks in a broadleaf crop in a field that was planted as cereals in the previous year, mainly due to redback cutworm. And then we had 26% of the reports were associated with damage in a broadleaf crop planted to a broadleaf crop in the previous year. And if we look at the breakdown of the broadleafs and the cereals, it's primarily canola and pea for the broadleaf. And then we have a few reports of outbreaks in wheat, lentils, barley, flax, sunflower, and even in a wheat stubble field. So you have to take the quality of the information with some reservations, but in general, it looks like cutworm outbreaks are most likely to occur in maybe a canola field planted to wheat in the previous year, just as sort of a general pattern. And now I want to talk a little bit about uh, 
the cutworm life cycle. It's pretty straightforward, actually. All, all butterflies and moths have the same life cycle. So it begins with the hatching of the eggs, and they'll develop into cutworm larvae. The larvae or the caterpillars go through different growth phases, so we call these instars. And for cutworms, it's five or six different instars. And then the final cutworm growth phase or instar will become a pupa, and that pupa will become an adult moth. That adult will mate and lay more eggs. So that's a very simple life cycle. But the story is much more complex than that. Because different cutworm species have different life history traits. So they all have the same life cycle, but the different life phases occur at different times of the year. So this is a, a short list of some of the more common pest species, and I picked it just to emphasize the differences in life history traits. So for example, if we look at uh, under larval feeding, we can see that some of these cutworms feed at the soil surface, above the surface. Some of them feed climbing up into the canopy of the plant. Some of them feed completely underground. You never see the cutworm. It's always underground. And then if we look at the life stages, the egg, the larvae, the pupae, and the adults, some of these cutworms are overwintering as adults. Those are species which are actually flying in from probably the U.S. So depending on which way the winds are blowing at certain times of the year, we can have outbreaks of uh, cutworms being blown up from the south. But for those species that overwinter in Canada, we have larvae that hatch from eggs in the fall. The larvae feed a little bit, and then they go underground and overwinter. And then first thing in the spring when it warms up, they're active and they're feeding. So if they emerge into a field of uh, winter wheat, you've got a problem. We have other cutworms that overwinter as pupae. So it takes them a while to finish their pupation cycle, become an adult, and then lay eggs until you get to the larval stage, which is the one we're concerned about, because that's the only stage that causes any kind of crop damage. And then for redback cutworm and pale western cutworm, those actually overwinter as eggs. So the eggs are laid in the fall. They actually start to develop a little bit before the snow comes. So they're, they're cutworm embryos inside the egg. And then when it warms up, the eggs quickly hatch, and the larvae emerge looking for something to eat. So as I say, the, the, the uh, cutworm pest complex is complex. The other thing I want to point out is that most cutworm species in Alberta have one generation a year, but some of them have two generations a year. So bristly cutworm, for example, it overwinters as a larva. The larva completes its life cycle and produces a generation of adults in midsummer. And then that generation of adults will produce another generation of larvae later in the summer, which produces adults more in the fall. Those adults will lay eggs which hatch into larvae which then overwinter going into the next year. Identifying cutworms. If you're looking at something and it does not have all these traits, it's not a cutworm. It's a short answer. So very simply, cutworms, like all insects, have three main body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The head is usually a hard capsule. And on cutworms, they have a simple eye. We call it an ocelli, but it looks like a black dot. That's the eye of a cutworm. And then right behind the head, we have the thorax. And on the thorax, on the bottom, we have three pair of legs. And these are the same legs which remain in the adult. So we call these true legs because the adult keeps them. But if we move further back and look at the abdomen, on the bottom of the abdomen, we have abdominal prolegs. These are fake legs. They're not true legs. They disappear. They're not present on the adult. And then in the butt end, we have a fake pair of legs called anal prolegs. We have hairs. We call them setae. And then we also have spiracles, which look like dark holes along the side of the cutworm. And those are the openings into breathing tubes by which the cutworm takes in oxygen. So if it doesn't have all these traits, it's not a cutworm, which leads to my next few slides. We have a lot of things brought into the station which people think are cutworms, but they're really not cutworms. And I suspect most of you know what these things are, but just for being thorough, let's cover them again. So we have people bringing in wireworms. Maybe they haven't seen cutworms, they're not familiar with the term. They bring in wireworms, thinking they're cutworms, so on the wire worm, we can see the head capsule. We can see the three pair of true legs. But on the abdomen, there's no fake legs. There's no pro legs. So we know it's not a cutworm. And these, of course, develop as adults into click beetles, which are also an important crop pest. One aspect of my job is 
looking at insects and dung, so I have a certain fondness for dung beetles. And this particular critter here is a dung beetle that breeds in soil. And I can guarantee you, the third week in June, I'm going to get phone calls from people who are reporting crop damage. They're going to dig in the soil, and they're going to find these tiny white grubs. And some of the people are going to say, are these cutworms? They're beetle grubs. Uh, they have a head capsule. They have true legs, but they don't have the fake legs. And they form a C-shape whenever you find them in the soil. So these are pretty small. A full-grown cutworm is about um, maybe two and a half to three centimeters. These are only a, a few millimeters. And when you get densities of these of about a few hundred per square meter, yeah, they can be causing crop damage. But they're not a cutworm. They're a type of dung beetle. We often have people bring in millipedes thinking these might be cutworms. Look at the number of legs on these suckers. M many more than three pair of true legs or five pair of fake legs. So yes, they're kind of worm-like, they're round like a cutworm, but they're not cutworms, and they really don't cause any damage, certainly not in agricultural crops. Now this is a tricky one, even for some experts. If we look at this slide, we have cutworms and we have fly maggots. And if you didn't know what to look for, you'd be hard-pressed to tell the two apart. So on the one side, you see the cutworms, and if you take a closer look, you can pick out the head capsule, and you can pick out the, uh, the pro legs, the, ones, the legs that are under the abdomen, but it's a bit hard to see the true legs on this sucker. Um, on the fly maggots, they don't have a head capsule, they don't have legs, but in terms of color, size, and shape, they look very similar to cutworms. And when these fly maggots become adult flies, they turn into crane flies. And you've all seen crane flies that look like giant mosquitoes, is the best way to describe them. And you can get high numbers of these crane fly larvae in uh, particularly turf grasses, and they can cause damage. But usually they're not a pest on the prairies. This is a slide showing you some of the beneficial insects in a field. You know, we talk about insects, we know the pest insects, but sometimes we forget about the good guys. And I like to think of the good guys as sort of a standing army at your beck and call. And as soon as you have a pest outbreak, they're out there chomping on those pests. So this particular group of beneficial insects are parasitic wasps. There's many different types of parasitic wasps. And for cutworms in Alberta, they're probably attacked by several dozen different species. So this species is a parasite which is well known from Europe. It was first reported in Canada in 2009, so we've done a bit of work on it. It will lay its eggs, perhaps 100 to 150 eggs, in a caterpillar. And over the course of about three weeks, those eggs will hatch into wasp larvae. The wasp larvae live inside the body of the caterpillar, and they take great pains not to kill any essential tissues or organs. So over the entire time that the wasp larvae are developing inside the caterpillar, the caterpillar is feeding, it's moving around, it's probably thinking to itself, it's got gas, um, but really it's in a bad way. Because after those three weeks are out, those wasp larvae start chewing out through the sides of the caterpillar and begin forming cocoons. And in the video, we actually have several hundred little tiny wasp larvae chewing their way out of this caterpillar, uh, spinning their cocoons. And inside the cocoon, the wasp larvae would form a pupa. And then after about a week, that pupa would produce an adult wasp. And then that adult wasp would go out and kill more cutworms. What is particularly interesting about this species of wasp, there are no males at all in the population only females. So that means that every individual, 100, 150 individuals that come out of this cutworm can emerge and go out immediately and look for more cutworms to kill. It also has many generations a year. So this is a new addition to the parasite complex in Canada and hopefully in future years its number will increase and help suppress cutworm populations. Now this is the other video I was going to show you. Um, we'll cut to the chase. It, it shows you a Bertha armyworm caterpillar, and out of view is a uh, ground beetle. And a ground beetle is a common name given to a group of beetles for which there are maybe 300 species in Alberta. So these ground beetles, they range in various sizes. I've got the full scope of sizes on this slide. Um, the biggest ground beetle there is a native species. It's more associated with native grassland. And then right beside it, the second largest is the one that shows up in this video. And gr uh, ground beetles of that size can take on a full-grown cutworm and kill it 
within seconds. That's what the video is gonna show you. And even if they don't eat that cutworm, they can kill many large cutworms in a day. They don't have to eat what they kill. And on the other extreme, those very tiny guys, they can't take on a full-grown caterpillar. They get squashed. But they can sure as hell eat a lot of cutworm eggs. So between the little ground beetles and the big ground beetles, they're out there working for you night and day to help control your pest problems. And as I mentioned before, there's about two or 300 species of ground beetles in Alberta. In an individual field, there might be perhaps 30 or 40 different species. And the densities can range from roughly maybe six to 10 adult and immature ground beetles per square meter. So the numbers are pretty impressive. So let's talk a little bit about cutworm damage. This is a photograph taken of uh, pale western cutworm damage during the outbreak of 1985. And I think it's pretty obvious where the cutworms were feeding. So if you're a producer and you're finding patches like this in your field, you want to go out and take a look to find out what the heck's going on. And if there are cutworms, you're going to see one of three things. It depends on the species of cutworm. So if it's a climbing cutworm species, you'll probably see the cutworms right in the crop canopy. If it's an above ground feeding cutworm species, look for severed stems or leaves have been clipped off from older plants. And if it's a below ground cutworm species like pale western, you won't see the cutworm. You'll just see a row of dead and dying plants. And the, uh, the pale western cutworm, it'll actually cut the plant, the, the young plant, and it'll pull it underground. You can actually see, it's almost like a Bugs Bunny cartoon where you see this carrot being pulled underground. Um, cutworms are like that, pale western. They'll take a little plant, they'll pull it underground into their tunnels, and they eat the whole thing underground, and you actually see no sign of what's causing the damage. Scouting is the most important thing you can do for cutworm control. You've got to be out there in your fields early at the right time of year. If there's an outbreak, you need to know, so you can nip it in the bud before you lose any of your crop. So, as I said before, some of the species overwinter as larvae. So as soon as it warms up in the springtime, they can be out there causing damage. Other species that overwinter as eggs, it takes a little while for those eggs to hatch, but when they do, those species are also can be quick to cause damage. So if you detect a thinning or bare patch in your field, walk over there, take a look. Don't look in the bare patch, okay? That's gone and done. Those cutworms have caused the damage and they've moved off nearby and they're now feeding on live plants. So in this slide, we want you to check in areas of live plants near the bare patches, but don't check in the bare patches. You probably won't find the cutworms there. And most cutworms are actively feeding when it's uh, cooler and more humid. So they're feeding, feeding in the evening or at night. So if you're gonna be scouting, ideally you wanna scout in the early morning or in the evening. When you're looking for the cutworms during the daytime, most of them are underground or hidden underneath loose debris. So you need to walk out into these areas. You need to look at the base of the plant, in the crown of the plant, and maybe down as deep as um, one, one and a half inches or two and a half, three centimeters in the ground. And don't stop looking just at one place. Walk around, maybe look at 10 places, and spend three or four minutes at each place just to find out what the, uh, is causing the damage. Cutworms like to move in the seed rows because the um, ground is not as hard packed. So check the seed rows and keep checking and digging. And it's not uncommon to be driving down a grid road and see a flock of seagulls feeding in your field. Well, you know they're feeding on something and there's a good chance they're feeding on cutworms. So use that as an indicator. Walk over there, take a look. Now in terms of cutworm control, there's different chemical methods of control for sure. There's uh, seed treatments available and foliar sprays. I'm not gonna talk about specific products. Uh, the products may change from year to year, but in that book that I encourage you all to pick up, we have a list of online resources that you can check to find out what products are currently available for use in your region. But in general, you have to ask yourself some questions. Are the cutworm numbers big enough to justify control methods? So depending on the species of cutworm and the crop, Threshold densities can be one to six cutworm per meter square. Then you have to ask yourself, okay, so we have some reason to spray, but is the area of the field big enough to worry about? If it's just one acre being affected, do you have to spray the whole field? Also, what is the size of the cutworm? Mature cutworms in that final caterpillar phase are about uh, maybe one to one and a half inches long. At that point, they're done their feeding. 
be most concerned about cutworms that are younger, maybe a half an inch long or an inch long. But if it's a small area and the cutworms have already reached their full size, they're no longer feeding, you may not have to spray. But if you do decide to spray, target just the affected area. If, as I said before, the outbreak is affecting one corner of the field, you don't have to spray the whole field. It doesn't make any sense. The only thing you're going to accomplish is killing all your beneficials. So target the area directly affected, as well as a buffer strip about 10 meters wide or 30 feet wide. And then you want to spray when the cutworms are going to be exposed to the insecticide. So remember they're feeding in the evening and at night. So spray your insecticide in the evening if you can. The cutworms that feed underground, like pale western, they're protected from direct spray. There's, not, there's nothing you can do about that. However, they will eat the, the, um, the foliage with insecticide residue on it. So when they pull those plants underground to feed, they'll still come into contact with the insecticide and die. And as always, apply according to uh, label directions. And just to come back to sort of an underlining theme, do whatever you can to conserve the beneficials in your field. If you, if you absolutely have to spray the whole field, then do what you got to do. But just pause and think for a little bit about some of those uh, beneficials that are going to be affected as well. And just to finish up, a very sincere thank you to the organizations that provided funding for research over the past few years and also allowed for the publication of this cutworm guide. Again, freely available online as a PDF. And I want to thank you, uh, Scott Mears and Shelley Barkley, who work for Alberta Agriculture. Uh, they provided me the information on the cutworm monitoring maps that I used in my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Flo. Are there any questions for him? We've got one back here. Go ahead. So I think the question is, what's the effect of cultivation versus no-till on cutworm populations? You know, it's kind of funny. Uh, before we had chemical, insect uh, chemical herbicides, they used to add, uh, farmers were encouraged to till because the idea was to get rid of all the green stuff in your field so when the cutworms emerge in the spring, they'd have nothing to eat. Um, that's no longer the case. People just spray herbicide. But it is true that if you disturb the land, you break it up and you uh, turn it into a finer powder, and when cutworms are laying their eggs in the fall, they're looking for lighter soils, a fine structure, and often that's where you find your cutworm outbreaks originating from. So drifts of soil along a fence line or a field edge. So there's some value to not cultivating. So the question is, will cultivation disturb the cutworms that are there? So if you had... Um, certain species of cutworms that overwinter as larvae. Cultivation would certainly physically kill some of them. It would also turn some of them up on the soil surface so birds could get at them and predaceous beetles and such. But I don't know if that by itself would justify cultivating a field. Yeah. Any other questions? Is there, you know, you mentioned some of those beneficials and that we're starting to see more of that one type. Is there anything we can do to encourage the beneficials uh, or can we introduce them or breed them? Is there anything that can be done uh, to help encourage the good guys and let them get rid of the bad guys? It's an excellent question and I have to be a bit diplomatic here. Um, really the best things we can do are the things we don't do because we want to maximize crop production. So we get rid of hedgerows, we get rid of shelter valves, we get rid of old homesteads, and those are all little places where the beneficials can persist. You know, with modern farming techniques, we don't want to leave any wetlands. We just want to homogenize the landscape into one crop so it makes it easy to cultivate. And I really get all that. Like, I understand it, but unfortunately, it's exactly the opposite of what we should be doing to protect the beneficials. So as long as we're going to adopt those practices, the next thing we can do is think about use of uh, chemical products, Pick chemical products, if you can, that are high specificity. I mentioned, for example, that there are seed treatments that are on the market recently for cutworm control. If you use a seed treatment, that's probably not going to affect the beneficials because they're not feeding on the seeds. But again, if you use a seed treatment for cutworm control, there's no guarantees that field would have had cutworms in the first place. 
So it's a bit of a gamble. Um, there's talk about reintroducing some beneficial species to different parts of the prairies. There's work underway to do that. I think by and large, a lot of these beneficials will find their way on their own. They're pretty strong flyers. That um, parasitoid video I was going to show you, that parasitoid was recovered in southern Ontario. We think it might be in Alberta, but we just need to do more research to find if it's here. But, but certainly beneficials could be redistributed. Okay, anything else on the fascinating world of cutworms? Looks like you've answered all our questions. Uh, thanks so much, Dr. Kevin Floyd. As we can see, uh, you know, you're not going to run out of things to do because uh, it's such a complicated and, and fascinating world. And uh, thank you for the work you've been doing on it over the years. And we look forward to hearing more of your uh, studies and research results. So thank you very much.